All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, John. <clears throat> Welcome to Beulah Baptist Church. Glad to see everyone with us. Um, hopefully, everyone who's not here is enjoying their sleeping in because they forgot to set the clocks this morning. Um, but here we are. Um, we're continuing our study in 2 Samuel chapter 10 this week. Uh, we've got all 19 verses to cover. Um, so let's open with a word of prayer if we can. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the sunshine that you greeted us with this morning, Lord. After yesterday's snow, it's so nice to see the sun this morning. And Lord, we just ask that you be with our nation. Lord, be with um, the people of Ukraine, um, with Russia's involvement in all of this and all of the other nations involved. Lord, please be with them. Lord, but we know that um, everything's in your hand. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, chapter 10 of 2 Samuel, um, it's an account of, it's another account or rendition of David's conquest. Uh, so we're going to see some detailed information about a battle he was engaged in. Um, and he actually did not seek this out. <clears throat> um, this was forced upon him, and David had to react. Um, in any way that a king would have at that time. Um, so the instigators here <laughs> were the Ammonites uh, that we'll see. Um, but that wasn't the prior relation. We're going to see as the story unfolds, it's actually the king of <clears throat> Ammon dies and his son takes over. And the son is the one who instigates this battle between David and um, between Israel and his nation. Um, so let's begin. Verse 1, it says, In the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died, and his son, Hanan, succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanan, um, son of Nash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanan concerning his father. Seems normal, right? David wanted to express his sympathies for the passing of the king. Uh, they had had good relations in the past, um, <clears throat> and that king had showed kindness to David. David, in turn, said, well, I'm going to show kindness to his son. I'm going to reciprocate the kindness. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about, you know, we... we read about all of these nations and these different peoples that he's in battle with, but who were the Ammonites? Does anybody know who the Ammonites were? Uh, they were neighbors to Israel, um, and they actually have modern-day descendants. Um, does anybody know what nation they are now? Israel. No. Oh. <laughs> Jordan. Ammon is the capital of, or we call it Amman today, Jordan. Um, and the modern day city of Amman is built on the ancient site of Ammonite, of the Ammonite kingdom. Um, so the modern day um, Jordan uh, is who we're talking about. Uh, that was where this nation was. Um, so right next door. Um, so David sent this delegation and it says, when David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite commanders said to Hanan, their lord, do you really think David is honoring your father by sending envoys you, by, to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you only to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So he's getting advice from all of his buddies around him, his commanders, and I'm sure they were his father's commanders as well. But they're advising the son that David may not have the best intentions. And we know because we have the story to look back on and see. David had no ill intentions in sending these men um, to him. Um, I guess the only thing that would have made it better is if David had appeared in person to express his sympathy. Um, but they're telling him, do you really think David <clears throat> has your best interest? He says, David has sent them to you only to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it. So Hanan seized David's envoys, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments, 
at the buttocks and sent them away. <laughs> yeah. So they had a breezy trip back home. Uh, but he shaved off half of their beards. And isn't that kind of weird when you think about it? You know, why did they do that? Well, you have to understand the custom of that day, and you also have to understand Le the Levitical law <coughs> that God handed down to the Jewish people. <coughs> if we go back to Leviticus, um, in chapter 19, verse 27, one of God's decrees said, Do not cut the hair at the sides of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. That was one of his commands. Um, so they weren't allowed to shave, cut off the sides of their hair. They could cut their bangs, and but they could not cut the sides of their beard. They could trim it, it says, with scissors, but they weren't allowed to use a razor. Um, and to further dig into that, I did some research into the rabbinical laws because, as you know, you know, Jesus was not happy with them making so many extra laws but during the time of Jesus' ministry, at that time, the rabbinical laws had created over 600 extra laws on top of what God had already decreed. And they made all of the silly laws, like you couldn't spit on the ground because that was rolling the dirt and it meant you were plowing on the Sabbath. And so if you did that, you were in violation of the Sabbath because you were working. Um, so they made up all of these extra little laws that weren't necessary. But they added to the uh, beard and to the shaving. Um, in, the, in ancient times, um, they allowed men, as I said, to trim their beard with scissors, but they were forbidden to use a razor. Um, and in that day, and the only thing we can equate it to now is the modern-day Amish or Mennonite community, um, it was a sign of a man's maturity when they grew a beard. The same thing with the Amish, the Mennonite, and as you know, as they're growing up, they shave, right? It's not until they marry and settle down that they grow a full beard. And that's how you can tell who the uh, mature crowd is, the adults, uh, the head of the household, um, but they were to be set apart. Um, so we have the Levitical law. Um, but the rabbis added the shaving of the face, about not shaving the face. But in that day, it was a symbol of the man's piety or his standing. And if he had a big flowing beard, then that was a way of saying, this is a trustworthy man. Um, he was a godly man uh, because of his beard. Um, and... In ancient times, the only time a beard was allowed to be shaven was under the direction of the priest when there was some type of infection. Um, so if it was lice, or for instance, or they had some kind of skin disorder, then the priest would instruct them to shave completely um, to help stop the infection and to treat it. Uh, the only other time they did that was during times of mourning. And we have records of that uh, through the Old Testament, um, and the one that I chose to share is from the book of Job. Um, when Job found out <clears throat> that all of his children had been killed and all of his crops were destroyed, all these things happened to him, it says in Job chapter 1, verse 20, it says, At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head, then fell to the ground in worship. So that was the only other time they were to shave their beards was during times of great mourning, and that was okay. Um, but um, have, are any of you familiar with the Kabbalah in uh, Israel? Um, it's a religious sect. <coughs> um, they call themselves Kabbalists, um, but they actually believe in mystical um, things. And they believe that a man's beard possesses mystical powers in the Kabbalah. A man's beard not only represents the creation of the world being divinely inspired by the Holy One, but it also symbolizes God's mercy um, is how they look upon the beard. 
Uh, so they were not to shave these beards. They were treated with great respect. Um, and if we turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 4, uh, we have an example of how another um, enemy treated their prisoners of war. And so this was a common practice in that time. In Isaiah chapter 20, verse 4, it says, So the king of Assyria will lead away, stripped and barefoot, the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. So um, to be exposed in that way in ancient times, it was a very shameful thing. And so when these men were sent back home like that, it was to shame them. Uh, so they had their beards shaven. Only half of their beards were shaved off. Their rear ends were exposed on the way home. And so it was to shame them. Um, it was to, you know, this king was basically thumbing his nose at King David by doing this. Um, so all kinds of things going on behind the scenes with that. Um, so he says, when David was told about this, he sent me messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, stay at Jericho till your beards have grown back and then return home. So he didn't want them to have to bear further shame by coming back to Jerusalem looking this way. So he told them, look, just stay in Jericho for a while, let your beards grow back, buy you some new pants, and <laughs> then you can come home. Um, so he was looking out for their best interest there. Um, and also, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus, you know, to be modest, you know, the church has always shown Jesus wearing basically a loincloth, if you will, but that was not the Roman practice. They were actually stripped completely naked because that was to shame them. Um, so the, anybody who was crucified was stripped completely naked when that happened, and they were hung on the cross without clothes um, to have more shame put upon them. Um, verse 6, it says, When the Ammonites realized that they had become obnoxious to David, so they realized we might have messed up. <laughs> Maybe we overstepped. Um, you know, and they realized that now we've become a sore spot in King David's eyes. Um, and King David isn't known for losing any battles. Um, so it says they hired 20,000 Aramean foot soldiers from Beth Rehob and Zobah, as well as the king of Mecca with a thousand men and also 12,000 men from Tob. So they're hiring mercenaries. They're looking for anybody. They're just hiring guys off the street and saying, will you come help us fight? Um, and these other nations were basically what you would refer to as like a city-state. Uh, they were much smaller nations. So when going up against somebody like David and the nation of Israel, you had to kind of farm out and get more support to help you fight David and fight Israel. But in the book of Chronicles, as I mentioned, Chronicles is almost an exact duplicate of the story that we're reading in 2 Samuel, but it does often give us more detail into these stories. And uh, in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 19, is an almost exact duplicate of what we're reading today. However, it does give us a little more detail for one section here. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 19, verses 6 through 7. It says, When the Ammonites realized they had became, become obnoxious to David, Hanan and the Ammonites sent a thousand talents of silver to hire chariots and charioteers from Aram, Nehrim, Aram, Mecca, and Zobah. They hired 32,000 chariots and charioteers, as well as the king of Mecca with his troops, who came and camped near Mediba, while the Ammonites were mustered from their towns and moved out for battle. But the interesting thing I wanted to point out that it covers here is the price they paid 
for these men. It tells us that they sent a thousand talents of silver. And it's easy for us to read over that and just say, yeah, they used some silver. But when we equate that into today's money, that many talents of silver is 38 tons of silver. Can you imagine a truckload of 38 tons of silver? That's what they paid to get these guys to fight for them. Um, so they were paid really well. Um, but it's hard to fathom 38 tons of silver. Um, I mean, in a bidding war, that, that would be hard to put down, wouldn't it? Um, if somebody else was trying to hire them and this guy is showing up with 38 tons of silver to pay them, I think they're going to go with the 38 tons of silver. Um, so it was a massive sum uh, that they bought these men with. Um, so he says here, he continues, he's bought these men, hired these other uh, armies to do his bidding, um, and also the men that he hired, um, it mentions the Arameans. So who are the Arameans? Here's another group of people. We talked about who the Ammonites were. Who are the Arameans? That's modern-day Syria. Um, and so they were the Syrians um, of that day and what later became the nation, Syria. Um, so that's who, this, who these people were. Um, but the region extended much further than that. They were little outliers, but it extended into southern Turkey, um, Lebanon. Um, so all, out, all throughout the region is where these hired guns were coming from um, that they hired. So it says, on hearing this, David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. Now remember, who is Joab with David? His general. His general. He's the leader of the army. He's the top dog. And so he sends Joab out with the army. Um, and he says with the entire army of fighting men. Not just a detachment. Not just 3,800 men. The entire army. Um, it says the Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance of their city gate. While the Arameans of Zobah and Rehob and the men of Tob and Mecca were by themselves in the open country. Joab saw that there were battle lines in the front of him and behind him. So he selected some of the best troops in Israel and deployed them against the Arameans. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and deployed them against the Ammonites. Joab said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you are to come to my rescue. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come to rescue you. So they're looking out for each other's back, and they're like, look, if you need help, I'll come back you up. If you see that I'm falling behind, you'll come back and help me. So they've got this battle plan now to go out and stop uh, these armies. He says, be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. So they've got the right mindset because they're not just going out there for themselves. They're giving this battle to who? God. And he's saying, God's going to do this battle the way he wants. And we're fighting for him. Um, so he says, be strong. Let's go out there and fight for the Lord. Um, but he says the battle is God's. Um, then Joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the Arameans, and they fled before him. They didn't even fight. <laughs> they just ran. Um, here, here he's assembled his army, and he's going out to meet them in battle. They flee the other way. Um, when the Ammonites realized that the Arameans were fleeing, they also fled before Abishai and went inside the city. So Joab returned from fighting the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. So they, they went out there prepared to have this huge battle, and these guys just turned coat and run. <laughs> so much for that 38 tons of silver. Um, so maybe they uh, should have upped their price there. Um, it says... After the Arameans saw that they had been rooted by Israel, they regrouped. Hadazer 
had Arameans brought from beyond the Euphrates River. They went to Helam with Shobak, the commander of Hadassar's army, leading them. When David was told of this, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan, and went to Helam. The Arameans formed their battle lines to meet David and fought against him. So this time they're actually going to stand their ground and fight. But you'll notice it's different men. It says they went and got other people from way across the Euphrates. So the ones who ran originally, they're gone. So they had to go out and get other guys and regroup and come back to fight again. Um, so it says they formed their battle lines to meet David, fought against him, but they fled before Israel. And David killed 700 of their charioteers, 40,000 of their foot soldiers. He also struck down Shobak, the commander of their army, and he died there. When all the kings who were vassals of Hadassar saw that they had been rooted by Israel, they made peace with the Israelites. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and what, what is a vassal? It's also easy to read that and think, in the world's a vassal. But they had ties with that king. They, were, they had alliances with these other kingdoms. Um, so they were associates, um, and they had struck deals with um, the Ammonites. But when the other guys saw it, they were like, I think we made a deal with the wrong king. Um, so they sent word to David, uh, we're with you, buddy. <laughs> um, we, we're, um, we're not going to fight you. It says they made peace with the Israelites and became subject to them. Um, so the Arameans were afraid to help the Ammonites anymore. So nobody else would help them again <laughs> because they saw what happened. And David just decimated them. Um, he went out and destroyed them. So when Joab and Abijah went out to fight, all of the armies fled. They didn't have to lift a finger. They just went back home. But when David got involved, they started to flee too. But David didn't let them get away. Um, it says he got them and he killed how many of them? He killed 700 of their charioteers, 40,000 of their foot soldiers. It's hard to imagine a battlefield like that. I mean, we've seen movies of recreated battles, and I always think of the Civil War when they were lined up, you know, in that battle formation. And it's hard to imagine fighting a battle like that today, isn't it? Because the front line would drop, and guess what? The next line would keep coming. <laughs> and it was just basically a suicide mission um, to fight that way. Um, but that's how they did it. And it tells us that he killed 40,000 foot soldiers. Um, but all of the other kings were there too, and they saw what happened because they were there to help the Ammonites. And when they saw how completely and utterly useless it was to fight against David and the nation of Israel and to fight against God, um, they said, we better form an alliance with David pretty quick. Um, and they realized that they were fighting a losing battle. Um, but if we also look at the second psalm, um, it talks about nations fighting against God and fighting against Israel. Um, psalm, chap psalm 2 says, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. But, verse 4 is the best part, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And you can almost see it in your mind. You can see God looking down from heaven going, those idiots. <laughs> if only they knew who they were messing with. And he says, he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, 
the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. And it was also a foretelling of Jesus Christ. Uh, not only was he talking about the nation Israel and David, but he was prophesying about his son and how his son is going to rule. And we're told that when Jesus returns, he's not going to return like he came. He's going to return like a king ready for battle. And he's going to rule him with a rod of iron. There's not going to be a lamb coming this time. It's going to be the lion coming. Um, and he's going to settle it once and for all. But, you know, it's, it's reassuring with all that's going on in the world. And you see all of this stuff in the news. Isn't it reassuring to know that it says the one enthroned in heaven laughs? And he's looking down just going, bunch of fools, you know. Look at what they're doing. And it doesn't bother him in the least. You know, it's scary for us, but we can't see the big picture like he can. Um, he's got it all under control. Um, you know, <clears throat> Joshua was reading to me out of one of his science books at home, and it talked about the universe and how expansive the universe was and how far away all the planets were and, and how massive the universe was and how long it was. And he said, well, how do they know how long it is? I said, they don't. Nobody's been up there with a measuring tape. But the Bible tells us that the universe, compared to God, is the breadth of his hand. And how do you me measure the breadth of someone's hand? In the Bible, it was from the end of their pinky to the tip of their thumb. The entire universe is in the palm of God's hand. And it's nothing to him. And it's so expansive to us. We can't comprehend it. But he's the one looking down. He's the one in charge. He's, nothing surprises him. We wake up, turn the news on, and we're shocked at what we see. He's not. He knows what's happening, and it's all part of his plan. Um, and everything's going to work out the way he says it's going to. Um, and like I always say, like any good book, you know, there's always when you get to the end of the book and you find out what really happens. I've read the end of this book, and guess what? We win. <laughs> um, so we don't have to be worried that we're going to lose um, and be scared. So let's close in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for enduring it all of these ages for us to be able to read, to be able to look back on the history of your people and how you worked miracles through them and for you, Lord, and that we can learn from these historic moments in David's life, in the people of Israel. Lord, help us to be able to trust in you as David trusted in you and you fought for them. Lord, help us to realize that you'll fight for us as well. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.